Good morning, and a really warm welcome to you this morning at St. James's Church. I'm Sam, and I'll be hosting the service this morning. Uh, and uh, Sam, uh, not this Sam, a different Sam, will be coming to, to preach to us later. But it's really good to welcome you here on Palm Sunday uh, to worship God uh, and to celebrate and to point to Jesus as King. Um, I'm going to start um, with a reading from the book of Psalms. And it says this, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And in that spirit, we come on this Palm Sunday to worship Jesus. Now, Palm Sunday was the day where Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, where the crowds were cheering, the, ch the crowds were proclaiming him as king, saying, blessed be the name of the Lord, shouting, Hosanna. And we're just going to, to start this morning just with a short video, just to refresh ourselves, just to remind ourselves of that story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. So we read in the Bible, we see on there that one of the things that the crowds did was they spread their cloaks before Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, I know at St. James we're into sacrificial worship, which is why we've turned the heating down to 12 degrees today. So if you want to, if you are able during this first worship set, I just want to encourage you to symbolically lay your cloak down. Put your coat down on the floor as an act to say, Jesus, we welcome you. We acknowledge you as king riding on a donkey. So we're going we're gonna to have a, a time of worship. And if, if you can keep a little bit of a, a, a passageway in the middle of the aisle, that would be really helpful. But if you want to do that as part of an act of worship, laying down your cloak before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Thank you, Jenna. We love. 
the crowd sang Hosanna, they laid down their cloaks, but they also waved palms. Now, I've not seen many palms being waved this morning, and we don't have many palms, but what we have got are some palm crosses. So during this next worship song, I'm going to invite you to come and take a palm cross and use that this morning as part of our worship and of our celebration of Jesus. So join the next song. Please come up and do that. And uh, just try not to trip over the coats as well. Okay. <laughs>
Uh, I'm going to ask you to remain seating for uh, a f- uh, so, sorry to remain standing for a few moments, <laughs> and I'm going to invite all those uh, that are all, all our children and young people who are going to be leaving for the, do their groups in a moment. If you, all the children and young people could come up to the front, and any leaders that are going to go out, could they come up to the front? Because we have before us the scene is set. We have our palms. We have the cloaks spread out along the way. We have the crowd in good voice. And what we want to do is recreate some of the chaos, some of the exuberance of Palm Sunday as our children and our young people go out to their own groups. So what I'm going to invite them to do is I'm going to invite them to leave but by going through our, our sea of cloaks. And as they go through their sea of cloaks, you are the crowd. You are the crowd here on that first Palm Sunday celebrating Jesus. So you need to be in good voice. You need to be saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, praise God. Okay, can you do that? So as our children and young people leave along the way, on the, on the spread of coats, let the crowd cheer, let the crowd worship, let the crowd acknowledge Jesus as King. Off we go. Has- Thank you, crowd. You're in good voice. Please be seated. Wow. Imagine that first Palm Sunday. Incredible. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mark to come up uh, and invite Sam. Uh, so we've got an exciting development to, to share with you this morning. And Sam is just going to uh, have a quick chat with Mark. Or Mark is going to have a quick chat with Sam. Quick chat with you. Great. So uh, this is Sam. You know Sam. This is Sam. Sam, tell us, tell us what um, what you do. <laughs> as in, as well, as in, as in your role with, because you've got one of these funny white things on, haven't you? I do. And we do some funny things with a funny white thing on. We but do. you have a specific role within the diocese. That's so right. Yes. Would you so tell us? I am known as the bishop's chaplain in the diocese. So. Um, what, uh, what do I do? It's, it's not actually that easy to, to pin down. Um, as you mentioned earlier, that, that line in your job description that says, and anything else that needs to be done within the, you know, the workings of this role, that is a very important line in my job description. Um, the, uh, the main purpose of the bishop's chaplain is, is to serve the, the work uh, of the, the senior team in the diocese and be part of that senior team. And um, I have some acute responsibilities in that in that we we have a team uh, that uh, supports the work very practically so in terms of vacancies and filling in making sure the right people are in the right places in terms of admin we've got some admin staff and financial things and all of that making sure everyone gets paid Um, and uh, so I look after that and make sure that that all functions correctly and but then apart from that uh, it's quite a nice job because you get to dip in and out of anything and everything that needs to to be done. So the bishops can't be everywhere um, at once, so quite often I'll be uh, there in their stead um, helping decisions go. Um, They uh, can't know everything, so I try and keep my ear to the ground and feed in what's happening um, around the diocese. 
Um, and um, they're, they're brilliant, our bishops, at coming up with wonderful ideas. Um, and um, they sometimes mistake the having of an idea um, with the, the, the practicalities of that idea actually coming into place. Um, so they move on very quickly to the next brilliant idea, presuming, therefore, just by having the idea that it happened. And that, that's not how it works. Yeah. Um, so it won't be me, necessarily, that puts everything into place, uh, that wonderful idea, but it might be that I find the right person to do that and try and work it out. So, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. I, 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 I concur with that. Right. So, um, but uh, we're really excited because... Um, Sam is going to be, and we're not sure how this is going to happen, but, but the official thing is to be licensed as associate priest with St. James's. So that's really exciting. Yeah, give him a round of applause. So I've been talking to the bishop, and Sam's been talking to me and the bishop, and, and so he's going to be become associate, uh, associate priest here. It doesn't mean that I'm going anywhere. I'm still staying here. Um, but Sam is going to come on board um, with us in the, in, in, in the team and uh, be part of the team. So Sam, what, what, just give an idea of what we might think that might look like um, going forward. Well, that's still to be nailed down properly. Yes. Um, and, and we'll allow it to do that. We'll allow it to figure itself out as we go, I think. Um, I, I won't be leaving my job, so this will be doing something. But I, I don't have a, a church where I have responsibility in my role. So I tend to, um, as part of my role, go into different churches, and particularly if there are issues, if it's a long vacancy, if there are some troubles, um, I'll go in and invest some of my time and energy into there um, and then move on. But I just thought for a season, instead of investing my energy into other churches. I, I wanted to invest my energy into this church. So you will see a bit more of me on a Sunday, including um, uh, hosting and preaching, um, but also I'll get stuck into some of the structures and looking at what um, needs to be done elsewhere and talking to you about what that looks like. Um, but of course, one of the things that also prompted me was you have a wonderful team, both uh, employed and volunteers, um, but I wanted to come alongside and support your ministry and for you to have a sort of a priestly companion, whatever that might look like, and support you in what you do. Um, so, uh, so that was one of the things as well, to support you. So exactly what it will look like? Well, we'll probably have another conversation in a, a year or two's time and see what that looked like. But yeah. We'll have a conversation before that. We had a conversation over the... <laughs> We had a conversation over the <laughs> photocopier, actually already, it about very, what, it, yeah. <laughs> what it might look like. But um, yeah, so that's really exciting. We just said, uh, this is a God thing, and uh, let's see what God might have for Sam and have for us as, uh, as, as we move forward. So yes, yeah, Sam will be much more involved up front. Um, you'll see him much more, but he'll also be part of the PCC, part of the leadership team, uh, part of the staff team when he can um, come. But the danger is we don't want him to do two jobs. Uh, we want him not, not to stretch you too much. Um, but we will do, please pray as we go forward that we'll find the right roles and right things that suit you and, and suit where we are. What else would you like us to pray for, Sam, before we move on? Yes, let's pray for some of the discernment over that. Um, pray for me for capacity to try and make sure that I do that right and well um, and that I'm not taking on too much. Um, and uh, I, I, I just noticed your wife's face at that point. It was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we have spoken about this, Barry. This isn't the news to you, is it, Barry? <laughs> this isn't a surprise on this occasion. No. <laughs> Um, but yes, obviously, as that face will tell you, we need, we need that. So let, um, pray for those things. Yeah. 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 Let's pray, shall we? Father God, thank you for uh, your call on all our lives to be Christians, to be witnesses. And uh, thank you for the call, particularly on Sam's life. Thank you for calling him to all his work as a bishop's chaplain. All, uh, all thank you for all that he does and all that he is in that senior leadership team. And all that he brings. So, Father, pray, pray for him, particularly in that role, uh, particularly as we give thanks for a new Bishop of Burnley. Um, would you help him this week with all the services he has to take and, uh, and, and his input into that team? But, Father, we want to thank you that he feels called to add uh, a ministry within this church. And, and, Father, pray that you would help us as we discern what that may look like. 
Uh, Lord, we believe that you have called us for a purpose. Father, I do pray particularly for Sam and for Mary and for Lydia. Uh, for them as a family, we give you thanks for them. And Lord, we do pray that, uh, yeah, this would not be a burden. Uh, this would not be a stretch too far. We pray that there may be release from, uh, from the chaplain's office, as it were, from the bishop's office, uh, so that there may be a capacity for Sam to do these things and not, wouldn't just be an added extra. So, Father, thank you for him. Thank you for his family. And thank you for your calling. And thank you for this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That's really exciting. Um, uh, Naomi is bringing us the notices, but this week through the medium of video. That's next week, Mark. And then mime the week after. Naomi, I'm the operations manager for St. James's, and I wanted to share um, a few notices this morning. Uh, there's loads coming up over the next couple of weeks. So first up is Without Borders. Hopefully you've got these great flyers. Um, that's happening tomorrow evening, 7.30 at church, a chance for uh, extended worship, uh, time to be together, and um, should be really creative and uh, quite different from a Sunday morning. So really encourage you to come to that. Um, it's Holy Week this week. Uh, on Good Friday, we've got... Um, uh, Good Friday popcorn happening at 10.30. Uh, that's really aimed at families. So if you're a family with children primary age or younger, we really encourage you to come along at 10.30 on Good Friday morning for a whole morning of crafts and activities exploring the Easter story, followed by lunch. Um, so yeah, really encourage you to come along to that. Helen is also looking for uh, some team members to help with that. So if you're able to help with that, please see Helen. Uh, on Good Friday afternoon, from 2 till 3, Mark will be leading an hour at the cross, which is a reflective service uh, with readings and time to be still and silent and really consider Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. So that's from 2 p.m. till 3 on Good Friday. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and we'll be having our all-age services at 9.15 and 11.15. We are also having brunch in between from about 10.15 uh, on Easter Sunday. Um, last Sunday, um, I was looking for people to bring things, to bring uh, certain things. Um, I, I now have filled everything uh, on my list that I was hoping for, so that's really good. If you are still planning to come and you would like to bring something, please do bring something like hot cross buns or fruit or um, some granola and yogurt to share, uh, um, something that's brunch related and um, would be suitable. Network is out today. So there's copies of Network available uh, on your way out of the, um, of the service. But I particularly wanted to draw your attention to the prayer diary. Now, this can be found in the middle pages of Network, or you can get a copy of the prayer diary. It uh, gives you lots of prayer pointers for the month ahead. Um, and this has come from our social justice team. We would love, uh, as a team, to really equip people to pray um, for the world, for uh, our community, for our church and its various ministries. So we do really encourage you to grab a copy of that um, on your way out of the service. I think that's all from me and I will see you soon. Thank you, Naomi. Um, there's a, there's a, a couple of additional things I just want to mention. As we journey through Holy Week this week, um, the Stations of the Cross that have been uh, put up at Turret House are going to be open again this week on Tuesday night between 6 and 8 p.m., I think. So if you want to take part in that, uh, that's Tuesday night. Go, go down to Turret House uh, and spend some time with the Stations uh, of the Cross. Um, the other thing I just want to mention, could I just invite Janet up, please? So we have a, a, a great ministry of welcome at St. James, and Janet has been heading up our welcome team uh, for a while now um, and just wants to, to share where we are with the welcome team and, uh, and invite you to take part in that. Thanks, Janet. Okay, so those of you who don't know me, I'm Janet Sanderson, and um, I lead the welcome team, which is a great group of people, as you've experienced on the door who um, give a warm welcome to everybody who comes comes here to St. James. Um, 
for various reasons, we've had several people um, step down from the welcome team just recently. So we're running a bit short um, of welcomers because we have a different team for the 9.15 to the 11.15 service. Um, so if this is something that you would be interested in doing, um, if you're a people person, you love uh, welcoming people and talking to people, then um, please come and see me. I've already had two people from this morning's service, <laughs> which is great. Two ladies, so come on, fellas, <laughs> if you <laughs> um, can come forward, that would be great. It, particularly, I'd really love some young people. Um, uh, old people, you're very welcome as well, but um, <laughs> it'll be good to have a spread um, to represent um, the church here. Um, it really is an important ministry um, to just give give the love of Jesus to anybody who turns up at the door um, and to be sensitive to people's um, needs. You know, some people come to church full of beans, but there are others who are going through things. So you need to be a sensitive person who can, um, you know, just, just warmly welcome them and um, deal with those needs. So if anybody's interested, um, I am going because I've been at the morning, the earlier service, but um, if you just email Naomi, um, that would be great, and then she'll pass on your details to me. Um, so thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Um, I'm now going to invite Jasper to come and give our reading this morning, uh, following which uh, Sam will be coming to, to preach to us. So, thank you, Jasper. morning's reading's already been referred to, but it's uh, the one you'd expect, really, Jesus riding into Jerusalem from uh, Luke chapter 19, and it's verse 28 to verse 40. Uh, yeah. After saying these things, Jesus was going on ahead up to Jerusalem when he got near Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. He sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead, and as you enter, you will find a colt tied up that no one has ever sat upon. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone asks you why you are untying it, you shall say, The master needs it. Those who are headed out found things just as he had told them. Then as they were untying the colt, the owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the master needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and sat Jesus on it. And as he went along, the people were spreading their cloaks on the road. When Jesus came near the slope of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to rejoice. They praised God with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Well, some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your followers. But answering, Jesus said, I tell you that if these keep silent, the stones will shout out. And that's today's reading. I see we're playing a game of how many Bibles can you stack on one. <laughs> there we go, I'll keep playing, thank you. Let's play, let's pray, not play, let's pray 
as we come to consider God's Word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your Word, that it is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And we pray that it will be that for us today and that it will cut into and speak into our lives. Amen. Now, we're into Palm Sunday, so the start of Holy Week. And for those who were present, those who were in the crowd, and it will really be the crowd that I want to focus on, and we'll talk about that in a minute, it should be the um, least surprising event in the life of Jesus. And, and that's because there was a lot to do with the life of Jesus, that when it happened, you could sort of look back at the prophecies that were made about him, and you could say, well, oh, actually, I, I see where that was suggested, or I can see elements of, of this happening in the prophecies. But if you look at Zechariah 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you, coming righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. So, they should have expected exactly what was to happen, and that is exactly what did take place. And the wonderful thing about Palm Sunday is that the story that we've just seen um, played out and that we've heard read is absolutely stocked full of symbolism. Stock full of symbolism, things like the fact that the donkey was tied and untied, that it had never been ridden, that it was a colt, the fact that it was a donkey in the first place and not a great white steed or similar, the placing of palms on the ground, the taking off of cloaks, the fact that the crowd shout, hail Jesus this week when we know that next week they'll be shouting crucify him. And the thing is with all that symbolism, when you come to talking about it, when you come to planning a sermon about it, you've got a couple of options. The first option is that you do a proper 45-minute exegesis. And I thought about it. <laughs> but then I remembered what um, we were doing and the fact that I need to take a bit more responsibility of what I do in this place. Um, and thought, well, that might be for another time. So you could do a whole sermon series and that would be brilliant, but when would you do it? Because you can't do it before now and into Lent, and if we do it this week for the next couple of weeks, then we'll miss the whole of Easter. So I went with the third option, which was to ignore almost all of it. <laughs> and to suggest um, that uh, if you want to know more about all of that, then I can point you to a brilliant place and to come and to see me afterwards where you can think about that. Instead... I want to prompt a response. And one of two responses, or maybe both put together, and we'll see where you are um, at the end. But I just want to prompt a response. And I want to do that by looking at the thing about this story that fascinates me the most, which is the crowd. About who was there and what they did. Because you see, for me, as I read through the Gospels with this day in mind, and the crowd who will come to see representing us, the crowd being like sort of a bit of like, you know, the Guy Ritchie films from the 90s and noughties where there are loads of different story arcs and they're all happening and you're wondering what on earth is going on until they come together beautifully at the end. And that's how I see this crowd. As I look and I wonder, was that person there? The woman who was healed as she touched Jesus' cloak. And she was restored to the community, allowed to be back and present. Was she there? Those that Jesus healed, and they didn't come back to say thank you. Were they there? Nicodemus, the Jewish leader who not long before this, had to sneak to see Jesus in the night so that he wasn't caught. I think he almost certainly would have been there. But what was he doing? He couldn't have been worshipping. His job wouldn't have allowed it. The rich young ruler. Now his response really fascinates me because he, if you remember, 
is one of the only people that turns away from Jesus and is sad when he does that. I hope and pray that he turned back. But when was he there? What happened to him? There were a lot of people there, and I don't know. All of that is wonderful speculation that I can think of, and I won't know this side of eternity. But what we know is that the same thing brought them all to that place and provoked a response. You see, they have been watching his ministry. They've been listening to his words. They've been following him some closer than others, and they have decided that he is the Messiah. That's what's brought them there. They have decided he is the Messiah, and they respond accordingly. Now, different people will have come to that conclusion in different ways. But if we are the crowd today, the challenge to come to our conclusion over that question remains today as much as it did 2,000 years ago. Now, one of my favorite authors growing up was C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia. And I was a delight in the fact that it was then one of my daughter's favorite um, authors, and she read that over and over and over. And whilst he did write brilliant fiction with a good challenge, he was also a wonderful theologian. And he wrote a book called Mere Christianity, which poses that same question. If we are the crowd looking on to Jesus, what is our response to who he says he is? And actually, he says it's the most important decision that each person needs to make. He sets it out in a particular way. He says that he was either a liar, a lunatic, or he was who he says he was. And I'm going to read a, a, a bit of a quote from him. So this is C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying a really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. That is, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a good moral teacher, but I cannot accept his claim to be God. This is the one conclusion we cannot say. A man who is merely a man and says the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be a lunatic. On the level of a man who says that he is a poached egg. The other option is that a man who says these things is a liar, akin to the devil of hell himself. You are faced with this choice. He goes on to say the only other option is that he was indeed what he says he was. The choice is yours, but you must make it. The choice is yours, but you must make it. Now, those who were there clearly made that choice. They decided that he was the Messiah, that he was King Jesus. How did they respond? Well, they responded by making his way clear, by taking off their cloaks, by putting the palm leaves down, by worshiping him. And I wonder, if we are the crowd, what is our response? And I said that this morning wasn't of that, it wasn't that 45-minute sermon which would educate you onto lots of different things, but instead to provoke a decision. And this is the first, a twofold challenge. If you have not yet decided who Jesus is, today is as good a day as any to do that. To have a look at the things that he said. To have a look at the things that have been said about him. To talk to those who already accept him as king and lord and have come to that conclusion and to figure out why they came to that conclusion. If it's your way 
to read something like mere Christianity to challenge your thinking about who Jesus was. But he doesn't leave us with the option to just think he was good. So we have to decide whether we think he is Lord. If that's a decision that you've been approaching, if that's something that you've been considering, or if that's not something that you've thought of until now, I would encourage you to do some of that work. And uh, prayer ministry will be available at the back or a member of the team, any one of us that you would like to speak to, I'm sure would be delighted to talk to you about what that is for them. But I think today is as good a day as any for you to make that decision for yourself, to come to a conclusion. Who is Jesus? Is he a lunatic? Is he a liar? Or is he actually Lord? If you have already come to that decision, then the prompting to action is slightly different. It's to consider how we respond as the crowd responded. What things need to be laid down? What things need to be taken up? What obstacles are in the way of him being Lord of our lives? Because they immediately move to worship, you see. And when they move to worship, they do it in a way where their actions change. And we're the same. We are fickle humans still. But we don't live in that place. And that's not what we're called to. We're called to worship him. We worship him because it is our duty and our joy to do so. We're called to worship him because he comes as Messiah, the one to save us. We're called to worship him because, as we will remember over the coming days, his death and his resurrection bring life in all its fullness and life eternal. So that's going to be my second prompt. Let's have the worship leading band to come up and help us do that. If you have decided that he is Lord and King of your life, we worship him in song, but also in our actions through the week. But let's do that. Let's worship him. Hallelujah. In this next set, if you um, feel like you need to remain seated to continue your response, that's fine. But if you're ready, then we can stand and worship as well.
of worship. As part of that crowd that looks on Jesus and recognizes him as king, him as Lord, him as the servant king, bringing life in all its fullness to us. We pour out our praise. We pour out our worship to you, Lord. And if you are in the crowd and are wondering, who is this Jesus? Who is he? Then today is as good a day as any to decide. And I just encourage you, if you're feeling some anxiety, some fear of stepping into that decision, then to remind you that he is the God of love. He is the God of peace. He is the God of joy. He is the one who brings life in its fullness. He is the one that comes to us where we are who sits beside us, who comforts us. I just encourage you during this next hymn to find someone to pray with, to pray for Jesus to come into your life, to acknowledge our sins, to recognize him as Lord and sovereign of our lives. And as we approach Holy Week, as we think about the passion, the suffering, the death of Jesus, we just call to mind now those three people that we are praying for, that they may know something more of Jesus, that this week, This week may contain the day where it is the day to make that decision. We pray for the encounters we may have with those people. That we may show something of Christ's love. That we may show something of his kingdom. That we may announce and bring his kingdom into their life. that they may give their lives to to the Lord to the Saviour to the only one who is worthy of our praise we pray this Holy Week that our community may experience an outpouring of his spirit that the revelation of the living Lord may flow through these streets may flow through our lives and into the homes of those we know, those we meet and those we love. And that Jesus may be honored. That Jesus may be put on the throne. That the servant king may be exalted as the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. We worship you. We bring you songs of everlasting praise. And we continue in that spirit of worship now. Amen.
as we go out let's go out in that spirit of worship let's remember the crowd and their cries of hosanna their cries of the prince of peace and this week may we go out to proclaim the kingdom of god in this place for jesus name amen